Welcome to another episode of Follow the Money Show. I'm your host, Michael Madwell, and this show is the opinion of moi, Michael Madwell, not of the SWFI. What a wonderful day it is. I'm just going to enjoy my nice, delicious cup of coffee here. Just give me a second here. Mmm. Ah, refreshed. I feel good. Let's talk about the news of the day. The news of the day is Norway Sovereign Wealth Fund has essentially banned or excluded nine companies from their investment universe. Why? I'll tell you why. Basically, if you remember earlier this week, there was a false alarm in Hawaii. A tweet went out to, I mean, not a tweet, um, a message went out to everyone's cell phone saying, there's an imminent missile threat, and that obviously created panic in Hawaii, and it didn't happen, okay? Um, and it was caused by a state employee in Hawaii who was not terminated, but resigned to a new position. Talking about nuclear war here, fellas and gals. But to the crux of how this intertwines with the world of sovereign wealth funds, uh, Norris Sovereign Wealth Fund actually has a rule where they will not invest in companies that are engaged in the manufacturing or world of nuclear weapons. And so a number of firms have been on their bad list of exclusions. Um, there are five companies that have been on this, that have joined this list. Acom, BAE Systems, Fleur Corporation, Huntington Ingalls Industries Incorporated, and Honeywell International, which was already on the list. Other companies that have been on the list from this announcement by Norway's Sovereign Wealth Fund, which is actually, the decision was made by Norway's bank, which is the central bank, from council, from the Council of Ethics. So the Council of Ethics recommend these companies, Norway's bank gave the blessing, and then they are gonna execute it out there. So I brought the five companies that uh, are engaged in the production of nuclear weapons, according to them, and the other companies being excluded, Evergreen Marine Corporation, from Taiwan, Korea Line Corporation, Precious Shipping, Thoris and Thai Agencies, and another company um, that they were deemed is unacceptable risk of serious or sy systemic violations of human rights, at all SA. The four shipping companies I mentioned, um, the Council on Ethics recommended because of severe environmental damage or, and serious or systemic systematic violations of human rights. Okay, so again, Norway, they really focus on the E, the S, and the G, um, the E and the S are really being taken into consideration with this story here. So again, more companies being on, being excluded on Norway's sovereign wealth fund universe. While the wealth fund is in my last episode, um, the wealth fund is considering private equity investments, which is a major story. So if you are a private equity fund looking for capital, you know, Norway, Norris Arm Wolf is one to really look at, and they're not really, they probably won't be ready to allocate for quite some time, but it's one to really consider given the size of Norris Arm Wolf Fund, which is over a trillion dollars. It's over one trillion dollars. Now, that can change, but uh, I think the Wolf Fund's going to get bigger. Why? Because a, a major portion of the Wolf Fund is invested in equities. And what happened today? Today, the Dow hit 26,000 for the first time. Let me repeat that. The Dow hit 26,000 for the first time ever, right? Now, to counterbalance that, are we in a bubble? Is there an equity bubble? Many people think so. Will there be a correction? Probably, when? Who knows? That's the power of markets. It's a confidence game. Once uh, one big fish leaves, the rest of the fish follow. But for right now, the Dow hit 26,000, right? And that kind of leads into the world of cryptocurrencies because I talked about cryptocurrencies on my last episode. Let's see how Bitcoin is doing right now as we speak. A number of countries have been cracking down on Bitcoin. There was a story about South Korea, some of the latest issues there were thinking about banning cryptocurrency trading, but that story was debunked because there are other departments that are looking to promoting it, or at least looking more into it. Let's see how Bitcoin is doing right now. It's not okay. Um, 
let's see here. Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Let's go to, let's see all the other coins are doing. Because a lot of people have been investing in these other coins here. So, um, let's just go back here. And while I look at this and get the official pricing on it, uh, let's talk about um, some of the, okay. So the price of a Bitcoin right now is $11,750. Ooh, it dropped today pretty bad. Um, since last month, it went, so since last month today, Bitcoin has gone down almost 40%. Woo! Ethereum, on the other hand, has gone up 48.92%. And Litecoin is down negative 38.63%. Wow, this is a tremendous amount of movement going on in the world of cryptocurrencies. However, if we're going to do a year-to-date analysis, Litecoin is up 5,005%. Ethereum is up by 10,938% and Bitcoin is up by 12, 1,277%. So again, markets go up and down. Remember that markets go up and down, supply and demand, supply and demand. Very important to notice, right? Markets will not go from left to right up to the sky forever. There will be corrections, okay? Um, but what's fascinating is that the amount of money going into this sector and a lot of private money and individual money is going into Bitcoin, which is also fostering some institutional money. You have hedge funds now that are that are launched. You have uh, the Chicago CME. There's the Bitcoin futures. Goldman Sachs, I believe, has a trading desk on Bitcoin and other types of cryptocurrencies. So let's see how the space plays out. All right. Another. Oh, uh, still talking about cryptocurrencies. Uh, Vitalik Buterin, the co-founder of, of Ethereum, um, is apparently leaving Fenbushi Capital, which was formed in 2015. He's retaining his role as an advisor to Fenbushi Capital, but Buterin is the co-founder of Ethereum, which is one of the most popular cryptocurrencies. He's actually a Thiel Fellow, and he dropped out of the University of Waterloo in 2014. Uh, going back to the world of institutional investments, um, let's talk about the industry. Uh, Mercer, which is a huge investment consultant, they're one of the large ones out there. You can also look at uh, Aon Hewitt. You can look at uh, NEPC, Wilshire Associates. But Mercer just inked a deal to acquire BFC Asset Management, a Japanese investment management firm. Basically, BFC was spun out of Barclays Global Investors, BGI, for those old enough, uh, BGI was basically the index business, the iShares business, that BlackRock uh, is, you know, rebranded re and named. But Mercer has acquired BFC. Why? Because Mercer is seeing a tremendous opportunity in Japan. And if you are a fund manager and you are not in Japan right now, you need to be in Japan. Japan is going under a massive equity shift and it's already happened. A lot of the large pensions and asset owners are going into equities. Phase two is basically the E to the S to the G, the big G, the governance changes, the stewardship code. Japanese companies will be embracing or debating changes in governance. And that's going to be a very big topic, first in Japan, trickling down to Korea, and then going around Southeast Asia, possibly into China, but first Japan. So Mercer signed a deal to buy BFC. Um, we don't have pricing on it, but it, that is a very big story, I think, because, again, it shows that, um, you know, uh, investment consultants are taking this sector, this region, a lot more seriously, okay? Uh, from the environmental front to the E, BP plans to take a $1.7 billion charge to end legal claims on Deepwater Horizon. Not Deepwater Horizon, the movie, Deep, Deepwater Horizon, the massive oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico back in 2010. Right. And why I mentioned BP? Well, because BP is a stock that's owned by a sovereign wealth funds and pensions. That's why I mentioned it. Actually, the Kuwait Investment Office, which is part of the Kuwait Investment Authority, has been a major holder of BP. The Chinese state uh, safe investment company has, has been a holder of BP, and you also have other Asian sovereign wealth funds that are holders of BP. Okay. Um, news here, Oman is basically kind of uh, in the similar steps to diversify their economy, whether it's aquaculture, infrastructure, the Omaha State General Reserve Fund, 
just signed a deal with Saudi Arabia to create an Oman Saudi Arabian Joint Investment Fund, the Oman State General Reserve Fund, which is one of the sovereign funds which has been looking to merge into the Oman Investment Fund. Um, the Oman SGRF is looking to form a $1 billion infrastructure fund. Now that money will most likely go towards domestic infrastructure, but that money may raise third-party capital. My gut is telling me it's gonna be debt capital because debt is so cheap right now um, and rates are gonna be going up. So right now is a great time to raise debt. So that's what's going on in Oman right now. Also, uh, sticking in the Middle East, we have the Kuwait Investment Authority, which manages two sovereign funds. So technically, uh, people think it's one wealth fund. It's, it's an entity managing two pools of capital. Um, one is a savings fund and the other is an oil stabilization type of vehicle. Okay. The For the first time, Kuwait's parliament was notified that the sovereign wealth fund revenues exceeded oil revenues for the first time in the latest fiscal year. Wow, that's pretty stunning. In addition, the KIA uh, might go through changes. Again, this is still being debated in Kuwait parliament, but uh, there might be some corporate governance changes. Um, some may require full-time board members, uh, you know, maybe changing some of the competencies there. So again, that's something to watch out for is changes within Kuwait's sovereign wealth fund and what corporate governance changes will arise from that. And that will dramatically impact investment strategies and that will impact stocks and bonds and other types of assets out there. Almost almost great coffee here. Another note in the world of sovereign wealth funds heading over to China. The China Investment Corporation was revealed that they had a 16% return on their overseas portfolio. 16% versus 6.2% in 2016. So markedly improvements on returns. Again, a lot of sovereign wealth funds performed quite well in 2017, especially if they were allocated to listed equities. And the CIC, again, this 16% is just the overseas portfolio, which is about 200 to $250 billion. It's not the whole eight, 900 billion, because that's a lot of state-owned enterprises and large holdings. This is the actual overseas portfolio of stocks, bonds, hedge funds, private equity funds, real estate, some of their direct investments, special investments, okay? So 16% return, 6.2% return, and uh, this was revealed at the Asia Financial Forum in Hong Kong. It's a great event. I've never been, I've been invited to go to that event, but it's where a lot of the big names in. If you're really interested in uh, operating in, in Asia and those markets, specifically China, the Asia Financial Forum is a great place to go to. I just, you know, like I said, again, I don't get anything from it. I'm not endorsing it, but I'm just saying that I've heard it's a, it's a great place to go and a lot of, Big names were there. I'm not going to list all the names right now because I can go on forever here. But the uh, the head honcho, the CSC president was there and basically revealed those return numbers. And basically also said, um, on a personal note, to be clear here, he's not, the CSC is not taking the stance on this, but from personally, uh, he was quoted saying, minds are divided on whether the U.S. equity market is frothy at this level. My personal feeling is it is. So again, the Dow just hit 26,000 for the first time ever. This Asian Sovereign Wealth Fund, um, the president's personal opinion thinks that the market is quite frothy. Uh, also uh, about, f I believe 40% of the CSC's overseas portfolio is in the United States. Now, this kind of leads into the CFIUS, which is basically, um, there's rules that prevent foreign entities from buying and acquiring stakes in U.S. companies. It's called CFIUS, the Committee for Investment U.S. Oh, there's so many acronyms out there. But anyways, bottom line is, is that a lot of deals have been canceled um, recently. The U.S., uh, under U.S. President Donald Trump, um, his mantra is America first. And basically, uh, a lot of these deals have been unraveled. And uh, the federal government has taken a much stronger stance on cross-border transactions, especially from China, and especially in the technology sector. And uh, he also added at the conference, he said, faced with trade deficit with China, the U.S. should consider trying to increase exports to China. American exports to China has great potential. Besides beef and natural gas imports, 
the U.S. can still export a lot more to China, such as in the tech sectors. So a little hint there. He's trying to say, you know, uh, maybe CFIUS shouldn't be so tough. But again, uh, he's on the perspective of the CIC. So I'm going to take a pause here. I'm going to talk about the event coming up February 20th through the 22nd. The Institutional Investor Forum in Santa Monica. If you haven't signed up for it, go to iinvestorforum.com, iinvestorforum.com. We have a tremendous amount of speakers coming from all over the world. So unlike other pension conferences that are in the West Coast, you're not just going to see pensions and investors from the West Coast. We actually attract investors from all over the world. So if you're a fiduciary and you're an asset owner, and you're based in California, you're going to be able to see peers from the Middle East, from Europe, from Asia, and network with them and see how they're doing things. What is the best practice? What is, what is their perception on the markets? If you're an asset manager, well, your clients are here. Uh, if you are you know, looking to raise capital, if you are a corporation, you want to learn more about uh, just asset owners in general. So this is a great event to really expand your knowledge and make excellent uh, long-term connections and networking, all that kind of stuff. Again, if you want more details on it, uh, it's ifsummit.com is the main event site, but iinvestorforum.com, iinvestorforum.com, and uh, just email events, and uh, they will give you more details on it. And that's the America's event. And then the other event, that we're hosting is going to be in Japan, Tokyo, June 5th to the 6th on the, in the Ondas, okay? That's ifsummitasia.com. All righty then, we have a sip of my delicious brewed beverage here. What shall I talk about now? What do you guys want to, what do you want to hear? Do you want to hear about more sovereign wealth fund deals? Do you want to hear about ESG? Again, please put some comments down below. If you like this channel, hit subscribe. But what should, I, what should I talk about? What else do you want to know? You want me to go into the healthcare report? Um, shall I talk about investment in agriculture, aquaculture? Should I talk about India? Should I talk about more nuke divestments? Not only Norway dropped nukes, but uh, the large Dutch pension is dumping nukes and tobacco. Should I talk about Latin American strategies done by large pensions? All right, I'm going to end it with India. Okay, So the Modi regime in India has basically fostered an institutional investor's dream. Okay, So much money has flowed in in the Modi era that I've just, I just can't believe it. And, and there's a lot of reforms going on now. So just... Talking to my clients, sovereign funds, pensions out there, a lot of money is going into India, whether it's Indian equities, real estate, and infrastructure. Okay, um, with real estate, they'll partner with the local developer. They'll play both the debt and the equity side. With the debt side, uh, they'll partner with a bank or a local lender to get the insight on the credit profiles, whether it's on real estate developments, India has a huge population, uh, and there's a very big demand for real estate there. When it comes to listed equity markets, sovereign wealth funds and pensions participate in many of the large initial public offerings, whether it's Singapore's sovereign wealth fund GIC, Tamasic Holdings, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, the Kuwait Investment Authority, you have the Canadian pensions like OMER, CPPIB, and you're on the list here. PSP investments that participate in Indian equities. And then they also allocate to managers, right? Uh, you have managers that are the big names, the BNY Mellons of the world, the Statutes of the world. You have Enom. Uh, you have all sorts of managers, Wasatch, all sorts of managers out there that manage money for Indian strategies, okay? Um, now, a recent deal that I do want to bring up is basically uh, a deal that mentions the Housing Development Finance Corporation. Basically, they're raising a $1.75 billion offering, and they've been able to attract GIC, OMERS, KKR, Prem G Invest, which is the family office of uh, YPRO's founder, and a French, uh, a large French asset manager. So 
there's just, I mean, uh, it, it is real opportune time to uh, just witnessing a lot of foreign f uh, summer wealth fund flows going into Indian equities. Right, there's other emerging markets that are struggling right now. They're having a very tough time attracting capital, like Mexico. Mexico's having a very tough time attracting capital. Latin America's having a, a very tough time attracting listed equities. You have Venezuela, right? What's going on with the bond there? Um, you have Mexico, and uh, you know what's going to happen with NAFTA. Is NAFTA going to get repealed? Um, uh, who's going to be the next Mexican president? Um, one president of Canada, and I hate talking about politics, but this is relevant because of the fact that one president is more free market oriented and the other one is more socialist and they might want to seize assets. And Mexico actually has a pretty tough investment climate because you can't own properties along the beaches. You have to own them through trust. So what I'm getting to add is with, within the emerging market context, where is money flowing? And a lot of money is flowing into India, Indian equities. So uh, let me uh, just talk about one more story here while I have your attention here. And uh, I did talk about, did I talk about the, okay, the healthcare investment report, if you haven't heard about it, we wrote about direct healthcare investments made by solar phones and pensions. If you want to learn more about it, it's on the upper right side of our website. We do a, a few of these bespoke reports every year on various areas. You'll get a lot of insight onto which pharmaceuticals are being funded, um, which specific healthcare industries are more popular with sovereign wealth and, and pensions. So it's really good insight, especially if you're a healthcare investor. Okay? If, if you are a healthcare investor, I highly recommend uh, picking up that report. And that report is complimentary for our subscribers. Okay, um, Or you can buy it separately. Right. Uh, lastly, um, I want to talk about Hawaii. Because I started with Hawaii uh, with the nuclear warning. <laughs> um, I'm going to end with Hawaii with resorts. So uh, the GIC was very strategic, and they acquired a number of resorts from Paulson & Co., a hedge fund out in New York. And the GIC owned the 780-room Grand Walia property, and they sold to the Blackstone Group. Okay, They sold it. Um, and the Blackstone Group also acquired another property in a similar time frame. They acquired the Turtle Bay Resort on Oahu from investors including Credit Suisse and Wells Fargo. So I'm going to end on that note is that Hawaiian real estate is still uh, attracting institutional money. Again, these kind of assets kind of recycle their investor base. <laughs> one minute you're owned by a hedge fund, one minute you're owned by a sovereign wealth fund. And the last minute you're owned by the Blackstone Group. Anyways, thank you for joining and listening to my episode of Follow the Money. You can see Follow the Money Show off followthemoneyshow.com. You can see it off YouTube and through other venues in our mediums. Have a wonderful day. And um, producer, sorry. Have a wonderful day. Take care.